Bien, hoy vamos a ver una entrevista de San Alma en iCombinator. E bueno, los que no sabéis qué es iCombinator, e es una aceleradora de startups estadounidenses que ha incluido pues, empresas como Stripe, RBNB, Reddit, Twitch, Dropbox, ¿vale? Son empresas altamente conocidas. Y además San Alman pues, trabajó en ellos, eh, comenzó su carrera de socio a tiempo parcial en iCombinator. E Así que es una entrevista eh, a gente conocida y amigos. Pero también hoy se ha caído, hace seis horas, se cayó ChatGPT durante 30 minutos y puso aquí que era la octava web más grande del mundo, lo cual me sorprendió que hubiera crecido. Y bueno, ha puesto el enlace de similar web y vemos que las primeras Google, YouTube, las, o sea, de Google, las tres siguientes son de Facebook, Facebook, Instagram y WhatsApp, la sexta es X... La séptima es la Wikipedia y, correcto, la octava ya está ChatGPT, que para una empresa de hace dos años, si veis toda la lista, son empresas que ya tienen más de una década en el mercado. Bueno, bueno, dicho eso, eh, vamos a ver la, la entrevista y e Combinator. Os dejaré el enlace más abajo si queréis más. Crazy. I remember a rash of criticism for you guys at that moment. We really wanted to push on that. And we were far less resourced than DeepMind and others. And so we said, okay, they're going to try a lot of things and we've just got to pick one and really concentrate. And that's how we can, we can win here. Most of the world still does not understand the value of like a fairly extreme level of conviction on one bet. That's why I'm so excited for startups right now. It is because the world is still sleeping on all this to such an astonishing degree. We have a real treat for you today. Sam Altman, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Gary. This is actually a reboot of your series, How to Build the Future. And so welcome back to the that series like that you eight started. years ago? I was just trying to think about that, something yeah, like that. But that's okay. wild. I'm glad it's being rebooted. That's right. Let's talk about your newest essay on uh, the age of intelligence. You know, is this the best time ever to be starting a technology company? Let's at least say it's the best time yet. Hopefully yeah. there'll be even better times in the future. I sort of think with each successive major technological revolution, you've been able to do more than you could before. And I would expect the companies to be more amazing and impactful and everything else. So yeah, I think it's the best time yet. Big companies have the edge when things are like moving slowly and not that dynamic. And then when something like this or mobile or the internet or the semiconductor revolution happens, or probably like back in the days of the industrial revolution, that was when upstarts had their, have their edge. So yeah, this is like, and it's been a while since we've had one of these, so this is like yeah. pretty exciting. In the essay, you actually say a really big thing, which is ASI, super intelligence, is actually thousands of days away. Maybe, I mean, that's our hope, yeah. I guess, whatever. Uh, but that's a very wild statement. Yeah, um, tell us about it. I mean, that's, that's big, that is really big. I can see a path where the work we are doing just keeps compounding and the rate of progress we've made over the last three years continues for the next three or six or nine or whatever. Um, you know, nine years would be like 3,500 days or whatever. If we can keep this rate of improvement or even increase it, like that system will be quite capable of doing a lot of things. I think already uh, even a system like O1 is capable of doing like quite a lot of things from just like a raw cognitive IQ on a closed end, well-defined task in a certain area, I'm like, hmm, O1 is like a very smart thing. And I think we're nowhere near the limit of progress. I mean, that was an architecture shift that sort of unlocked yeah. a lot. And what I'm sort of hearing is that these things are going to compound. We could hit some like unexpected wall or we could be missing something, but it looks to us like there's a lot of compounding in front of us still to happen. I mean, this essay is probably the most techno-optimist of almost anything I've seen out there. Some of the things we get to look forward to, uh, fixing the climate, establishing a space colony, the discovery of all of physics, uh, near limitless intelligence, and abundant energy. I do think all of those things, and probably a lot more we can't even imagine, are maybe not that far away. And one of, and I think it's like, tremendously exciting that we can talk about this even semi-seriously now. One of the things that I always have loved most about YC is it encourages slightly implausible degrees of techno-optimism. 
and just a belief that like, ah, you can figure this out. And, you know, in a world that I think is like sort of consistently telling people, this is not going to work. You can't do this thing. You can't do that. I think the kind of early PG spirit of just encouraging founders to like think a little bit bigger. It is like, it is a special thing in the world. The abundant energy thing seems like a pretty big deal. You know, there's sort of path A and path B, you know, if we do achieve abundant en- energy, it seems like this is a real unlock. Almost any work, not just, you know, knowledge work, but actually like real physical work yeah. could be unlocked with ro- robotics and with language and intelligence on tap. Like there's a real age of abundance. I think these are like the key to in the two key inputs to everything else that we want. There's a lot of other stuff, of course, that matters, but the unlock that would happen if we could just get truly abundant intelligence, truly abundant energy, what we'd be able to make happen in the world, like both like come up with better ideas more quickly and then also like make them happen in, in the physical world, like to say nothing of it'd be nice to be able to run lots of AI and that takes energy too. Uh, I think that would be a huge unlock and the fact that it's I'm not sure it to be whether like whether to be surprised that it's all happening at the same time or if this is just like the natural effect of an increasing rate of technological progress, but it's certainly a very exciting time to be alive and a great time to do a startup. Well, so we sort of walked through this age of abundance, you know, maybe we have robots can actually manufacture, do anything, almost all physical labor can then result in material progress, not just for the most wealthy, but for everyone. You know, what happens if we don't unleash unlimited energy? If, you know, there's some physical law that prevents us from exactly that. Solar plus storage is on a good enough trajectory that even if we don't get a big nuclear breakthrough, we would be like, okay-ish. But for sure, it seems that driving the cost of energy down, the abundance of it up, has like a very direct impact on quality of life. And eventually we'll solve every problem in physics. So we're going to figure this out. It's just a question of when. And we deserve it. Uh, there's, you know, someday we'll be talking not about fusion or whatever, but about the Dyson sphere. And that'll be awesome too. Yeah. This is a point in time, whatever feels like abundant energy to us will feel like not nearly enough to our great grandchildren. And there's a big universe out there with a lot of matter. Yeah. I wanted to switch gears a little bit to sort of your earlier, you were mentioning uh, Paul Graham, who brought us all together, really created Y Combinator. He likes to tell the story of how, you know, how you got into YC was actually, you were a Stanford freshman. Um, and he said, you know what, it, this is the very first YC batch in 2005. And he said, you know what, you're a freshman and YC will still be here uh, next time. You should just wait. And you said, I'm a sophomore and I'm coming. And you're widely known in our community as, you know, one of the most formidable people. Where do you think that came from? That one story, I think I, I would happy, I'd be happy if that, like, drifted off the <laughs> um, Well, now it's, it's purely immortalized yeah, here. <laughs> here it is. My memory of that is that, like, I needed to reschedule an interview one day or something. Um, and PG tried to, like, say, like, ah, just do it next year or whatever. And then I think I said some nicer version of I'm a sophomore and I'm coming. But yeah, then, you know, <laughs> these things get slightly apocryphal. It's funny. I don't, and I say this with no false modesty, I don't like identify as a formidable person at all. In fact, I think there's a lot of ways in which I'm really not. I do have a little bit of a just like, I don't see why things have to be the way they are. And so I'm just going to like do this thing that, from first principles seems like fine. And I always felt a little bit weird about that. And then I I remember one of the things I thought was so great about YC and still that I care so much about YC about is it was like a collection of the weird people who are just like, I'm just going to do my thing. The part of this that does resonate as a like accurate self-identity thing is I do think you can just do stuff or try stuff a surprising amount of the time. And I think more of that is a good thing. And then I think one of the things that both of us found at YC was a bunch of people who all believed that you could just do stuff. For a long time, when I was trying to like figure out what made YC so special, I thought that it was... Bien, vamos a cortar el vídeo aquí. Como veis, siempre dice cosas interesantes. Os dejo el enlace al vídeo completo 
en la descripción de YouTube. Y como siempre, espero que os haya gustado y nos vemos.